Purgatory, Part 2, Chapter 35, Motives for Aiding the Holy Souls, Excellence of the Work. When we so highly extol the merits of prayer for the dead, we do not in any way infer that other good works must be omitted. For other good works must be exercised according to time, place, and circumstances. The only intention we had in view was to give a correct idea of mercy towards the dead and to inspire others with a desire to practice it. Moreover, the spiritual works of mercy, which have for object the salvation of souls, are all of equal excellency, and it is only in certain respects that we may place the assistance of the dead above zeal for the conversion of sinners. It is related in the Chronicles of the Friars' Preachers that a spirited controversy arose between two religious of that order, Brother Benedict and Brother Bernard, on the subject of suffrages for the departed. It was occasioned by the following. Brother Bertrand often celebrated Holy Mass for sinners, and prayed continually for their conversion, imposing upon himself the most severe penances. But he was rarely seen to say Mass in black for the dead. Brother Benedict, who had a great devotion towards the Holy Souls in Purgatory, having remarked this conduct, asked him why he was thus acted. Because, he replied, the Holy Souls of Purgatory are sure of their salvation, while sinners are continually exposed to the dangers of falling into hell. What more deplorable condition than that of a soul in the state of mortal sin? She is in enmity with God, and bound in chains of the devil, suspended over the abyss of hell by the frail thread of life that may be broken at any moment. The sinner walks in the way of perdition. If he continues to advance, he will fall into the eternal abyss. We must, therefore, come to his assistance and preserve him from this, the greatest of misfortune, by laboring for his conversion. Moreover, was it not to save sinners that the Son of God came upon the earth and died upon a cross? St. Dennis also assures us that the most divine of all divine things is to work with God for the salvation of souls. As regards the souls in purgatory, they are safe. The eternal salvation is secure. They suffer. They are a prey to great torments, but they have nothing to fear from hell, and their sufferings will have an end. The debts they will contract diminish each day, and they will soon enjoy eternal light. While the sinners are continually menaced with damnation, the most terrible misfortune that can befall one of God's creatures. All that you have said is true, replied Brother Benedict, but there is another consideration to be made. Sinners are slaves of Satan, of their own free will. Their yoke is of their own choosing. They could break of their chains if they pleased, whereas the poor souls in purgatory but can sigh and implore the assistance of the living. It is impossible for them to break the fetters which hold them captive in those penal flames. Suppose you met two beggars, the one sick, maimed, and helpless, absolutely incapable of earning his livelihood. The other, on the contrary, although in great distress, young and vigorous. Which of the two deserve the greater share of your alms? As surely the one who is unable to work, answered Brother Bertrand. Well, my dear father, continued Benedict, this is just the case with regard to sinners and the holy souls. They can no longer help themselves. The time of prayer, confession, and good works has passed for them. We alone are able to relieve them. It is true they have deserved these sufferings and punishment for their sins, but they now bewail and detest their sins. They are in the grace and friendship of God, whereas sinners are his enemies. Certainly, we must pray for their conversion, but without prejudice to which we owe to the suffering souls, so dear to the heart of Jesus. Let us compassionate sinners, but let us never forget that they have all the means of salvation at their disposal. They must break the bonds of sin and fly the danger of damnation which threatens them. Does it not appear evident that the suffering souls are in greater need and merit a larger share in our charity? 
Notwithstanding the force of these arguments, Brother Bertrand persisted in his first opinion, but the night followed and he had an apparition of a soul from purgatory, which made him experience for a short time the pain which she herself endured. This suffering was so atrocious that it seemed impossible to bear it. Then, as Isaiah says, torture gave him understanding, and he was convinced that he ought to do more for the suffering souls. The next morning, filled with compassion, he ascended the altar steps vested in black and offered the holy sacrifice for the dead. Purgatory, Part 2, Chapter 36 Motives for Assisting the Holy Souls Intimate Ties Which Unite Us to Them Filial Piety if we are obliged to assist the holy souls because of the extreme necessity in which they are, how much greater does this motive become when we remember that these souls are united to us by the most sacred ties, the ties of blood, by the blood of Jesus Christ, and by the ties of human flesh and blood, whence we have been brought forth according to the flesh. Yes, there is in purgatory souls united to us in the closest family ties. It may be a father or a mother who, languishing in those terrible torments, extends their arms in supplication towards me. What would we not do for our father or mother if we knew they were pining away in some loathsome dungeon? An ancient Athanasian, the celebrated Simon, had the grief to see his father imprisoned by heartless creditors whom was unable to satisfy. What was worse, he could not raise a sum sufficient to effect his father's ransom, and the old man died in prison. Simon hastened to the prison and requested that they would at least grant him the body of his father that he might give it burial. This was refused him under the pretext that, not having had it wherewith to pay his debts, he could not set at liberty. Allow me first to bury my father, cried Simon. I will then return and take his place in prison. We admire this act of filial piety, but are we not also bound to imitate it? Have we not also perhaps a father or a mother in purgatory? Are we not obliged to deliver them at the cost of all the greatest sacrifices? More fortunate than Simon have we wherewith to pay their debts. We need not take their place. On the contrary, to deliver them is to purchase our own ransom. We admire also the charity of St. John of God, who braved the fury of the flames to save the poor sick during a conflagration. This great servant of God died in Grenada in the year 1550, kneeling before an image of Jesus crucified, which he embraced and continued to hold claps tightly within his arms, even after he had breathed forth his soul to God. Born of very poor parents and obliged to support himself by tending flocks, he was rich in faith and confidence in God. He took great delight in prayer and hearing the words of God. This was the foundation of the great sanctity which he afterwards attained. A sermon by the venerable father John de Avila, the apostle of Andalusa, made such an impression upon him that he resolved to consecrate his entire life to the service of the sick poor. Without other resources than his charity and confidence in God, he succeeded in purchasing a house in which he assembled all the poor abandoned sick that he might give them nourishment for the soul and body. This asylum soon developed in the Royal Hospital of Grenada, an immense establishment filled with a multitude of aged and infirm. One day, a fire having broke out in the hospital, many of the sick were in danger of perishing by a most horrible death. They were surrounded on all sides by flames, so that it was impossible for anyone to attempt the rescue. They uttered the most heart-rending cries, calling heaven and earth to their assistance. John sees them, his charity is inflamed. He rushes into the fire, battles through the flame and smoke until he reaches the beds of the sick, then raising them up upon his shoulders. He carries them, unfortunate creatures, one after another, to a place of safety. 
obliged to traverse this vast furnace. Working in the heat of the fire for a whole half hour, the saint had not sustained the least injury. The flames respected his person, his clothes, and even the least hair of his head. God wishing to show by a miracle how pleasing to God was the charity of his servant. And those who save not the body, but the souls from the flames of purgatory, is the work less agreeable to God? Are the necessities, the cries and moans of those souls less touching to a heart of faith? Is it more difficult to aid them? Is it necessary to cast ourselves into flames in order to rescue them? Assuredly, we have every felicity in our power to affording them relief, and God does not demand great efforts on our part. Yet the charity of fervent souls inspires them to make the most heroic sacrifices and even to share the torments of their brethren in purgatory. Purgatory, Part 2, Chapter 37 Motives for Assisting the Holy Souls Felicity in Relieving Them We have already seen how St. Catherine de Ricci and several others carried their heroism so far as to suffer instead of the souls in purgatory. Let us add a few more examples of this admirable charity. The servant of God, Mary Villani, of the Order of St. Dominic, whose life was written by Father Maracci, applied herself day and night of the practice of satisfactory works in favor of the departed. One day it was a vigil of the Epiphany. She remained a long time in prayer, beseeching God to alleviate their sufferings in considerations of those of Jesus Christ, offering to him the cruel scourges of our Savior, his crowning of thorns, his cords, the nails and cross, any word, all his bitter pains, and all the instruments of his passion. The following night God was pleased to manifest how agreeable to him was this holy practice. During her prayer she was wrapped in ecstasy, and saw a long procession of persons robed in white garments and radiant with light. They were carrying the emblems of the passion and entering into the glory of paradise. The servant of God knew that they were the souls delivered by her fervent prayers and by the merits of the passion of Jesus Christ. On another occasion, the Feast of All Souls, she was ordered to work at a manuscript and to pass day and night in writing. This task, imposed by obedience, was a trial to her piety. She experienced some repugnance to obey, but she wished to devote that whole day to prayer, penance, and pious exercises for the relief of the suffering souls. She forgot for a moment that obedience should take precedence over all else. As it is written, obedience is better than sacrifice. 1 Kings 15.22 Seeing her great charity towards the poor souls, God felt safe to appear to her in order to instruct and console her. Obey, my daughter, he said to her. Do the work imposed upon you by obedience, and offer it for the souls. Each line you shall write today in the spirit of obedience and charity will procure the deliverance of a soul. It will be easily understood that she labored with the greatest diligence and wrote as many as possible of those lines so acceptable to God. Her charity towards the holy souls did not confine itself to prayers and fasting. She desired to endure a part of their sufferings. One day, whilst praying for that intention, she was wrapped in spirit and led into purgatory. There amongst the multitude of the suffering souls, she saw one more grievously tormented than the others, and which excited most tender compassion. Why, she asked, have you to suffer so much excruciating torture? Do you receive no alleviation? I have been, replied the soul, a great length of time in this place, enduring the most frightful torments and punishment for my former vanity and scandalous extravagances. Thus far I have not received the least relief, because God has permitted that I should be forgotten by my parents, my children, my friends, and relatives. They offer not a single prayer for me. When I was upon earth, being exclusively occupied with my extravagant toilet and worldly vanities, 
with feasting and pleasure, I cast but a passing thought upon God and my duties. My only serious desire was to further the worldly interests of my family. I am well punished, for you see I am entirely forgotten by all. These words made a painful impression upon Mary Villani. She begged this soul to allow her to feel something of what she suffered, and at that same instant it seemed as though a finger of fire touched her forehead, and the pain which she felt was so acute as to cause her ecstasy to cease. The mark remained so deeply impressed upon her forehead that two months afterwards it was still visible and caused her intolerable sufferings. The servant of God offered this, together with prayers and other good works, for the soul to which we have just referred. This soul appeared to Mary at the end of two months, and said that having been delivered by her intercession, she was about to enter heaven. At the same moment, the scar on her forehead disappeared.